just amazing, amazing, amazing. And it's like this information is like it's a time when it's a time for it to come out. And I have to thank Pascal very, very much for taking that position and the platform that he's taken because now it's allowing for a, a whole lot of other things to be communicated. Okay. Can you see that screen? Yes. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Categorical thinking very quickly. <clears throat> Uh, we've all seen babies when, they, when they're first born and their eyes are wide and, and they're just trying to take everything and they can't make sense of the world. And that we know that. And uh, Tia has just eloquently described what's going on there. But thinking in categories, as we grow older, and we do this with our children, we start talking about, you know, here's a picture of a fish, and here's a picture of a cat, and here's a picture of an elephant, and here's a picture of an insect, and here's a picture of a reptile. And we start giving them categories. And those categories allow the children to start making sense of the world. And you can hold up several different types of fish because they they meet the requirements. They have a tail, a fin, um, gills, things like that. They go, well, that's obviously a fish, even though it looks different to the last thing I showed. And then you might say that the uh, the uh, the child, uh, a kitten, and it's a cat. And then you show them a leopard, and it's a really big cat, but it's still a cat because it meets those definitional boundaries that we have taught our children to be cats. Now, categorical thinking is extremely, it's necessary and extremely useful for helping us to discern very quickly the situation, situational awareness, and then we can begin to make decisions in relation to that situation. Uh, extraordinarily powerful. The downside to this categorical thinking is you don't see what's right in front of you. So let me give you a very simple example to make the point. Now, the reason, the reason I covered this in a discussion with uh, Captain Kyle following up from Pascal Najadi's interview with us, uh, and if you've seen those interviews, very important, and the fact that I sat there for an hour and said nothing was equally important as to saying something, because Captain Kyle and Najadi were going at it, and, and two you know, genuine people trying to find common ground. And that's what's going to happen over the next few years, because we're going to have the reveal. Everyone's been waiting for the reveal. Well, here's some tips on how to get through it without losing your stuff, because it's going to blow people's mind. It really will. The stronger your categorical thinking, the more difficult it's going to be. So I'm going to use colour as an example. Excuse me. Now, we all knew about colour before Sir Isaac Newton. Of course we did. We had artists and even primitive man painted uh, pictures on the caves. But when he split white light into its constituent colours, the world changed. And he came out with uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. And they were the, the, uh, the colours that white light comprises. And then that was in 1704. Wolfgang von Goethe uh, came up with his own colour wheel, 1810. And he started to decide, well, we need better names for some of these things. Well, amongst others as well, obviously, because artists have been naming colours for a long time. But there's vermilion, for example. We're starting to stretch what the colours mean. Then, again, another, another attempt later. Uh, Wilhelm Bertzold's colour wheels at 1784 and tending to the, the light and the dark, as you can see, it transitions. And again, we're, we're just naming what exists. It's not like... Um, this was invented. We're just naming what exists. And that allowed us to see with greater clarity what was being spoken about. And there are, you know, traditional colour wheels, and everyone's familiar with this, and it makes a lot of sense. You have the uh, red, uh, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet in there, which is fantastic. And then the colours that are somewhere in between. Now, they don't necessarily have names. Well, most to most of us, they don't. And then other people, like... Um, Warren Mars decided to create his own colour wheel. Now, let's just dive into this one a little more closely because there's a, there's a strong lesson here to be learnt. <clears throat> Imagine you have a child and a young child and only understands the primaries. No, not primary colours, but you understand the, the colours of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. They will see with great ease when you say, where's red? And they, proud, they point to red and they parents pl uh, proudly clap and say, well done, to reinforce the correct decision. Where's orange, yellow, etc. And then they start to, new colours start getting introduced because life is full of more than just you know, six colours. But they are close enough to the colour for them to make some sort of sense. They'll say, well, that's sort of red, I guess, and that's sort of orange, I guess, and that's sort of yellow. But still, you say, point out, oh, I don't know, chartreuse. 
<laughs> the child's going to look blankly and say, well, I don't know. Okay, well, where's Vermilion? Uh, mm, same again. No good. What about the, um, and you get, you get the drift here. So if you were asking them to point out colours and you showed them their colour wheel, they literally have this dark area where they see nothing. It's just not there. They can't place it anywhere. They don't have a category. And so it doesn't exist. But then once they're named and you can start working it out, you say, well, where's peanut butter? Oh, that's peanut butter. Yes, I know peanut butter. I've eaten peanut butter. And I've had it with pale raspberry jelly, as the Americans do. So now they have two, because they have a category to understand what they're looking at. It's not red and orange. It's peanut butter and raspberry sandwiches. I got it. So they have a category. So they will see, you say to the child, now, where's peanut butter? Bang, that's peanut butter. And they now see. So previously there was nothing and now they can see it and now there's even more and you say to the child where's turmeric <laughs> same blank look but if they're an indian child well turmeric's a common um a common uh, spice they'll know and you go around the wheel and there are all these colors that have no names and so as far as they're concerned because they have no names it's yellow or sort of yellow green or blue green or something in between red and violet but they don't have the language, they don't have the category to understand what they're talking about. So it just doesn't exist. So we go back and now we've got the full colour wheel, very exciting, and it's coloured. And you've got red, oranges, yellows, greens, blues and violets. But let's go there. There's your chartreuses at the three o'clock position. So imagine teaching a child, well, between yellow and green, there are the chartreuses. And apart from being a, uh, an alcoholic beverage, it's actually a colour. So they don't have to say yellow, green. They start to see with greater definition greater granularity what it is around them same down the the 630 position you've got the turquoises oh okay so it's not blue green no it's its own color it's the turquoises then at the 1030 position you've got the pinks so once again the more categories you have the more the world makes sense the fewer categories you have and let's just go back to what that looks like mm. that's it look at what you're missing out now the metaphor here is quite simple and i don't mean to sound like uh, sound condescending because let's now introduce something a little more profound. An individual's notion of the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, the powerful intelligence outside of space, time, energy, and matter, and I'll ponder that for a day or two and give you a lesson in humility. Because we try to put our gods in a box. <laughs> and that's got to be the height of arrogance, I mean it, because when you are too strict, and you might have good reason to be strict, because this is the word of God and and yep. um and this is the way it is you'll exclude from your vision and your possibilities anything else now for example there are some that say there are no extraterrestrials so anything that happens of an unworldly nature well it must be from the angelic realm so it's demons okay that's a category you might want to put in let's put in the demons got that but there are other things. Hang on. Doesn't the angelic realm, and this is where you start to work it out. You've got to think. You've got to think, folks. Would an entity from the angelic realm name gold and babies to eat? Wouldn't think so. That sounds terribly terrestrial to me. Not necessarily human, but terrestrial. And so you start to expand. And this is the point. If we are too locked in what we think is true, because, and, and, and I understand this, the difficulty of changing your foundational thoughts that have got you to where you are it is yeah. akin to you're asking me to now disavow everything i have been taught by everybody i have trusted and yes it's exactly what i'm asking you to do yeah. not just dismiss it out of hand but to understand that there are more categories so at least all you've got to do all you've got to do is consider the possibility that when something appears in the next few years and a few months and years and it will be it will be catastrophically catastrophically upsetting for many people. Just create the possibility that there is a box off to the left or right in addition to what you've already got. You don't have to disavow everything tomorrow. That will send you in a psychotic shock, and that's what we know the White Hats are trying to avoid. But just create the possibility around the world that you understand that there are shades of green and yellow that don't fit into the green and yellow category, but there's somewhere in between like chartreuse. Mm -hmm. Once you get that as a yep. metaphor and, the whole and as thing i said before t was on stage t was on stage with me in canberra in front of you know hundreds of thousands of people and the question was asked and i said the biblical literalists are going to have a hard time with what's coming and equally so will the materialist uh darwinians 
are going to find out that Darwin knew he was wrong well before the book was published on the origin of species. He knew it. And yet people still claim that is true. Ladies and gentlemen, and I'll stop talking here to let the experts get stuck in. You must create for yourself the possibility of something outside your frame of reference. And let me just yeah. go through here because we go one more time. No, and after all, this is, by the way, have a look at that wheel. What's missing? Indigo. And indigo is one of the prismatic colours. It's not an option. How interesting is that? And this gentleman, for all his you know, good work, well done, he still left out indigo. Yes. And that's the one that's actually in light. The rest, purple, for example, doesn't exist in the, in the spectrum. That's made up. Brown doesn't ex exist in the spectrum. That's made up. And that's not a problem because that reflects our experience. So you can create these things, these names for categories that make no sense. Now, just to, well, didn't want to go there. Well, you can later if you want to. <laughs> right. Categorical thinking allows you to see the familiar but blinds you from the new. Yes. Please memorize this. You will see with great ease the familiar, but it'll blind you from the new. The world is comprehensible. And if it doesn't make sense, you might be missing a piece of the puzzle. How many times have I, have you, has everybody a point at some point in their life got, this doesn't make sense? Well, it does. The world is comprehensible. And if it doesn't make sense, you might be missing a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, yep. That's the that. first step to understanding that there's another category. Yeah. The world is comprehensible. It absolutely is comprehensible. Give an example really quickly. Some of the brutality that's been visited upon children on the planet, it's inhuman. And everybody says the same thing. How can one human do that to another? It's impossible. They can't. Well, they're, they're sort of right because maybe it's an inhuman life form that's doing it. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Now, in Australia, the, the, the farmers might have a paddock full of kangaroos and so they get, they get their 303s out and start roost because they're, they're a pest. And the roosts sit down and have a meeting that night and go, my God, what, how unkangaroo like And you see what this, this, this awful life form is doing to us. He's showing us. So from the kangaroo's perspective, it's just brutal and unacceptable, according to kangaroo morality. But according to the farmers, it's the only thing you can do is get rid of the pests. So maybe, just maybe, we are pests. And maybe, just maybe, they want to get rid of us. So once again, just a simple shift in your perspective allows you to consider the possibility of and that's all i'm suggesting consider the possibility that the world is comprehensible i just need more data that data might be unpleasant it might be depraved but please you've got to understand that and we'll finish off with this to recognize the missing piece you must have your eyes your mind and your heart open to the possibility anyway i'll leave it there and we'll yep. now um i love that